this video is protein transport nuclear import. The key structure for nuclear import is the nuclear pore. This has about 30 different proteins, and we're going to take a look at some of the different features within them. Sometimes the uh, nuclear pore is considered a kelp forest, um, which is why I have this picture over here. And in particular, the kelp forest portion is considered to be this part right here, uh, where there's this meshwork of a variety of different um, proteins. Uh, these are nuclear fibrils, and so they are going to prevent the movement of large molecules into the nucleus. However, they do allow small water-soluble molecule molecules to move through them here. And these proteins tend to have a, a large amount of unstructured regions, and so the polypeptides are sort of um, disorganized or disordered. And a uh, reminder, this is a flashback to when we talked about unstructured regions back at the very beginning of the course. So I'm going to do some labeling now, and you could either take a screenshot of this image so you can label it with me, um, or just look at the final product, and uh, you might have a copy of this from class as well. So here's the labeled figure. This is figure 15-8 in your book. Um, notice we always want to get oriented about where we're at. So the cytosol side is up here at the top. Nuclear side is um, on the bottom. And one of the main ways we can tell that is based on the nuclear lamina. Um, recall that that is uh, made up of intermediate filaments. And uh, we talked about that with the cytoskeleton. And this helps to um, cushion um, and uh, stabilize the nucleus and protect the DNA from uh, damage. Uh, so that's a little bit about orientation. Then let's um, look a little bit from the outside in. So here we see these long, squiggly um, proteins. These are cytoplasmic fibrils uh, based on their location. These are also made up of protein. And so they're going to connect up to these orange proteins, which um, we're not going to talk about um, in this particular part of the course. Then uh, as we move inward, uh, notice that um, as we go through the pore, we've got these unstructured regions with the nuclear fibrils. Um, I changed the labeling a little bit here, so I scribbled out the um, circle proteins and instead focusing on these light brown squiggles. Uh, those are nuclear fibrils, which have a large amount of unstructured regions and make a meshwork. Then we see that there's a nuclear basket here. I note this has a little different structure than the cytoplasmic um, fibrils, which look similar in terms of color, uh, but they've got this extra connection uh, between them. And this basically all together, this is the nuclear pore. And so basically things can kind of attach and slide down these cytoplasmic fibrils. Then they can be kind of filtered through um, uh, the nuclear fibrils um, and then funneled down through the nuclear basket if they're allowed entry. I also want to point out uh, some things about the nuclear envelope. So um, as we talked about before, the nuclear envelope is made up of two phospholipid bilayers. One of those phospholipid bilayers is the outer nuclear membrane, which is right here. Notice that's continuous with the inner nuclear membrane, which this is also um, a layer of uh, phospholipids. So each of these is a phospholipid bilayer, and so we end up with um, a kind of double membrane system for the nucleus. Here, let's look at detail about how proteins are brought into the nucleus. So first off, uh, let's talk about, in general, what is moving out and what is moving into the nucleus. So what goes out of the nucleus uh, is the ribosomal subunits as well as messenger RNA. Both of these, or all of these, are produced within the nucleus. Uh, and of course, messenger RNA is the product of transcription, which is happening at the site of the chromosomes um, and obviously is in the nucleus. We haven't talked much about this. You might have heard of it in other classes, but the ribosomal subunit are produced within the nucleus. Um, and here we're really focusing on import. So what comes into the nucleus um, includes transcription factors. So transcription factors are proteins. They are synthesized in the cytoplasm by ribosomes, and then they will act to affect transcription, either increasing or decreasing transcription rates for given proteins. And we've talked about a couple different transcription factors this year, including MYC um, and E2F. And basically, these transcription factors need access to the DNA. So they need to somehow navigate this process here. Likewise, hormones, um, which include helper proteins, can also um, come into the nucleus. And so these uh, proteins in particular contain a nuclear localization signal, or NLS. So the nuclear localization signal is written out here. So let's talk through this process. Basically, I've broken it down into several steps here, and this corresponds to figure 15-9 in your book. So 
we are looking at a prospective nuclear protein. Uh, they call this cargo, and so that's this green blob, and it includes a nuclear localization signal, um, which is shown in this darker green. The NLS is made up of several uh, positively charged amino acids, and, and as a reminder from the beginning of the course, amino acids have uh, can be positively charged, negatively charged, um, polar, uh, but have a partial charge, or they can be um, hydrophobic. And so right here we're talking about positively charged amino acids, and those include lysine and arginine. And again, this is part of the protein structure itself, so this is embedded within the protein and was translated um, and initially when the protein was produced. So already this protein was already destined uh, for the nucleus um, at that point. The nuclear localization signal can be recognized by nuclear import receptors, and then they can direct uh, this protein uh, to the nuclear pore by the cytoplasmic fibrils. And so basically here we see the nuclear import receptor in blue, and so that basically can glom onto this prospective nuclear protein, and then the nuclear import receptor basically helps the uh, potential cargo to slide down these cytosolic fibrils, or cytoplasmic fibrils. Next, the nuclear import receptors are going to grab onto short repeated amino acid sequences in this mesh tangle. These are part of the nuclear fibrils um, right in here. And so normally these short repeated amino acid sequences will be sticking to each other and so they will make this mesh work. However, the nuclear import receptor can uh, temporarily interrupt those interactions and open up a small pass passageway so that uh, that nuclear import receptor plus its cargo can um, navigate through this mesh. And basically the um, nuclear import receptor just kind of bumps along until it finally gets through the nuclear pore down here. And then they can slide along these um, portions of the nuclear basket and then the protein um, is released when it hits the nucleus um, area, nucleocytoplasm, and then it disassociates from the nuclear import receptor. Uh, the nuclear import receptor then can return to the cytoplasm. It basically can go back through the nuclear pore here, uh, through those fibrils, and um, repeat the process, finding some other cargo and bringing it in. I've numbered these steps, um, one, two, three, four, five, which corresponds to the steps over here. Next, I want to talk about what provides the energy for the import of nuclear proteins. And basically, the energy is provided by the hydrolysis of GTP, and it's mediated by a monomeric G protein. Uh, the GTPA is called RAN. You will re remember other monomeric G proteins, such as RAS. We also have talked about other monomeric G proteins, including Rho and RAC, and that was in the context of cell migration. They are a little family. They all start with R, and they have these three-letter designations, which is typical for yeast proteins. Um, and basically, this is just a reminder that this is a sort of um, similar protein in terms of its function. Though we see it has a very different role here, uh, mediating the import of uh, proteins into the nucleus. For the most part, I want you to know the, the names of the proteins. You don't need to know this whole cycle thing, but I'll talk you through it just so you can see it. Basically, we're looking at a side view or cross-section of the nucleus instead of um, so a little different perspective than we saw on the previous slide. And the nuclear pores are right here and here. And what we see is we've got our nuclear import receptor in blue, and now we see an additional component, which wasn't on the last slide, but and that is the RAN GTP and RAN GDP. So let's start over uh, down here. So basically, we're going to start off with our nuclear import uh, receptor. And it's in the nucleus here. And it has just dropped off the cargo. So remember that this has to get out of the nucleus, and so the way it does that is it grabs onto the RAN GTP. You can actually see here that it's exchanging RAN GTP for the cargo, uh, which is in green, and included that nuclear localization signal, which we saw on the last slide. So when uh, the nuclear import receptor is bound to RAN GTP, which looks sort of like an olive here, then it can exit uh, the nucleus through the nuclear pore. And basically, once it gets outside the cytosol, then it um, is hydrolyzed. So the uh, RAN uh, GTPase will hydrolyze the GTP into GDP. And, so, 
And so we can see that event right here uh, that the GTP ran has popped off the inorganic phosphate. Um, and this also leads to the disassociation of RAN with GDP um, from the nuclear import receptor. And this may sound familiar with the RAS um, protein, which we talked about with receptor tyrosine kinase signaling. Okay, and so now we've got our nuclear import um, receptor protein, which then can bind to its prospective cargo, this nuclear protein, which has the nuclear localization signal, and this is happening in the cytoplasm. Then this uh, can navigate through the nuclear pore, and after it gets into the nucleus, then exchanging, back to the beginning, uh, the cargo for RAN-GTP.